So first of all, um, I think that when we think about the development of life in the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, we have to remember that this is a new church. Um, they're not even one year old yet. Uh, it, it's, a, it's the creation of uh, a merger of the former Kievan Patriarchate, the Autocephalous Church, and the two of the bishops of the Moscow Patriarchate. So it's going to take a lot of time for them to adjust to their new environment, to the new situation, to new leadership. Uh, so what we see so far is, I think that what they're doing is they're trying to, to guarantee the unity of this new church from the inside. So for example, um, not long ago, Metropolitan Epiphany and a number of the bishops of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine went to Lviv to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the rebirth of autocephaly. And I think that what we see here in, in a celebration like this is that the, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine is uh, really solidifying its strongest base. The strongest base is in Western Ukraine, in Lviv, which was the birthplace of the this rebirth of the autocephalous movement in 1989. Um, it's also strong in places like Rivne and Volin, and certainly in, in Kiev. So we're going to see that they're going to solidify, um, they're going to honor, commemorate where, where they are strongest. And of course, recently, Metropolitan Epiphany traveled to uh, Sume and to Kharkiv and is going to places where the Orthodox Church of Ukraine is not particularly strong. You know, he said when they first received the Tomos of Autocephaly that his top priority was to preserve the unity. That unity was tested greatly in May and in particularly in June when uh, Filaret recreated the Kievan Patriarchate. Um, that was a victory for the Orthodox Church of Ukraine in that only a small handful of bishops went with Filaret in cre recreating the Patriarchate. And I think that that was a disappointment to what Filaret had hoped to achieve. Um, Filaret was under the impression, for one reason or for another, and it could be on the basis of conversations that took place, that he would govern, continue to govern the church as patriarch from the inside, whereas Epiphany would handle external relations. And I think that he expected that many would follow him in uh, recreating the patriarchy. And he had his reasons for this. It may have been on the basis of conversations, but it may also be because he thought as Ukrainians have thought for a long time that they need to have a patriarchate, the status of a patriarchate, to establish their, legi their legitimacy alongside the Moscow patriarchate in Ukraine. So I think that the Orthodox Church of Ukraine passed its first difficult test with, the, um, with this recreation of the Kievan patriarchate because the vast majority of the bishops and the faithful and the clergy who joined the merger remained within the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. So, so far, Epiphany, I think, is succeeding, uh, and his synod is succeeding in preserving that unity. Um, Any time that you have a unity uh, where, where things had been difficult beforehand and they had been tense, um, you know, each church was, was strongly established in its own position of comfort in its comfort zone to make that sacrifice to relinquish authority and power and a good example of this is metropolitan makari of Lviv, and to be willing to be part of a new structure where you are no longer the primary leader is a major sacrifice and so so far internally i think they they are passing this test and there will be many more tests to come uh, that will be posed to them. Uh, in terms of the external relations, the most uh, formidable obstacle facing the Orthodox Church of Ukraine is that to date, the only church that recognizes both their autocephaly and their canonicity is the Ecumenical Patriarchate. So far, none of the sister churches has recognized them. 
Uh, that being said, the, among the sister churches, none has uh, rejected them except for the Orthodox Church of Serbia. They have made it clear that they reject the canonicity and the sacramental validity of the clergy of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Uh, this weekend is another big test, another big roadblock for the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. In fact, right now, the bishops of the Orthodox Church of Greece are meeting in Athens. And it's been publicly announced by uh, Archbishop Uranimus of Athens that there will be an extraordinary meeting of all of the bishops on Saturday where uh, he will have a conversation with them about the Ukrainian situation. All indicators seem to point to formal recognition coming from Athens sometime on Saturday, and this will be ratified, if you will, once uh, Archbishop Ironimus uh, commemorates Metropolitan Epiphany as the primate as part of the liturgy uh, on Sunday. So the, the indicators seem to be pointing in the direction of the first uh, church, the first among the sister churches to recognize the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. And then we will see if other churches will follow suit. There's a general expectation that there could be churches that would then recognize uh, the OCU. Uh, among these could potentially be the, the churches of Romania uh, and possibly of Cyprus and even of Alexandria. Uh, but of course, the political pressure is is enormous on these churches from the side of the Moscow Patriarchate to withhold recognition. And that's one of the reasons that the process has been slow. And we can anticipate that it will be gradual. Nothing, nothing ever happens quickly in the Orthodox Church. Now, in terms of parish transfers, that was a good question. And I know that people are wondering about this. Uh, I think that I, I can provide a fairly... Uh, reliable answer to this question. There are a number of reasons that the transfers, the process of transfer has been slow. To date, somewhere between 500 and 600 parishes have attempted to transfer from the Moscow Patriarchate to the OCU. But we have to remember that the, the laws were passed under the previous administration, and when it comes to uh, completing the paperwork for transfers, this depends on local elected officials. Right now, the local elected officials are in a state of transition because of both the changes in the presidential administration and also the changes in parliament in Ukraine. Locally, new governors are, are uh, replacing their predecessors on the ground. So we can expect that for parishes and clergy that wanted to transfer, that that process is being slowed by this transfer in leadership uh, on, on the political level. Um, there is no doubt that there is a, a fairly large minority within the Moscow Patriarchate that wants to transfer to the OCU. Uh, and I think that it's fair to say that this is a minority. I, I can't give you a number on this, but it would certainly... The base of this would certainly be, again, in West Central Ukraine, and uh, by and large, the, the Volyn, uh, Rivne, Lutsk regions. Um, there is enormous pressure on clergy in particular at the local level to not transfer. Um, apparently, and, and this I heard from confidants in Kyiv, apparently there are sponsors uh, on the ground who are putting uh, financial and other pressures on clergy to remain within the Moscow Patriarchate. And what I think we have to understand is that for those who wish to transfer, that, that the reality on the ground is that even if there's been a change in presidential administration where President Zelensky is going to say, well, the, church, the state is not going to interfere in, interfere in the affairs of the church, we have to understand that politics are always local. And on the local level, there is opportunity that will be capitalized 
by local politicians to uh, to make sure that that they are pleasing whoever their stakeholders are. I can't say for certain who these stakeholders are. Um, but it's going to take a long time. I, I think we're talking about decades for all of this to be sorted out. So for those who are hoping for a quick union of all of the Orthodox, and I think that's what the ecumenical patriarchate wanted to do when he orchestrated the uh, first the unification council and then gave the Tomo Sawadocephaly, we're looking at, at a process that, that may require decades, and, and it's going to require some kind of a process of peace between the Moscow Patriarchate and the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. And in, by saying this, you know, I, I'm, for those who are in the Kievan Patriarchate, they, they might say, well, what about us? I honestly don't anticipate that the Kievan Patriarchate is going to emerge a, as an equal uh, partner in terms of numbers, in terms of the Orthodox scene. However, for the foreseeable future in Ukraine, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine and the Moscow Patriarchate are going to exist side by side. Will there be any movement for these two churches to reestablish Eucharistic communion first before they take a move towards administrative union? Uh, this is something that I think that, that any Christian of goodwill could pray for that they would set aside their differences, have peace, and learn to live side by side, because probably this is what would be needed first and foremost before there can be administrative unity. If there's anything that we've learned from the last 100 years of religious history in Ukraine is that if anyone attempts to do anything by force, uh, those who, who believe that... Uh, that they are being imposed upon, they will resist. Um, and so what we've seen so far is that the Moscow Patriarchate has remained largely intact in Ukraine, and we can expect, I mean, I think at some point, you know, the, the numbers will probably be 50-50. Um, and then maybe at some point, if the legal, uh, those who are in, in the position of political leadership allow the uh, transfer of property and parishes to take place peacefully, we may see that the Orthodox Church of Ukraine will, will have uh, larger numbers at some point in the future. I still think that the Moscow Patriarchate will remain in Ukraine. It's just part of, part of this larger process of history that will, will take a long time to resolve itself, however that's going to go. Uh, what I would personally pray for and what I do pray for is that these churches would, would, would kind of perhaps introduce a ceasefire of the polemics. And this, this is primarily on the ground, that locally they could learn how to get along and perhaps even uh, con-celebrate together. That would be the most meaningful step towards the possibility of an administrative union that so many have hoped for for many years. And, you know, the, there's also the question of, of the Greek Catholic Church. Uh, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that the Greek Catholic Church uh, has a per, is a permanent fixture and is the most, uh, is really the leading voice in Halachina. I have no doubt about that. Uh, the Greek Catholic Church has grown by leaps and bounds, particularly in cultivating uh, a religious intelligentsia through the Ukrainian Catholic University. The signs of hope that I'm seeing in this new environment in Ukraine, with autocephaly being given to the OCU, is that there could truly be meaningful dialogue. Um, we, you know, there's going to be Ukraine is, is a, the most religiously pluralistic country in Europe. These churches are going to live together side by side. They're going to have opportunities, not only through the All-Ukrainian uh, Association of Churches and Religious Organizations, but also uh, informally to do things together, to respond to crises on the ground, to lift people up, to, and especially to educate young people and to reach out to them. They're going to have opportunities. The first sort of sign that we see with the uh, emergence of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine 
is that there, there is a desire, not even a willingness, but a desire to have a meaningful dialogue with the Greek Catholic Church. I think what, what would be interesting to see uh, at, the, at the broader political level for the Greek Catholic Church, you mentioned um, the meeting with the Pope. Uh, recently, Patriarch Sviatoslav also met with Patriarch Bartholomew. Um, will, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure, noise coming uh, from other Orthodox voices that claim that unionism is a roadblock not only to Christian unity, but also even to dialogue. So you have that um, Orthodox position on the one hand. But on the other hand, in Ukraine, the Greek Catholic Church has has had a veritable resurrection since 1989, and it's there to stay. And I think that, that the question is going to be how what will be the identity of the Greek Catholic Church in this new environment, especially as the OCU in particular uh, attempts to claim that they are in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. Um, so really what I foresee now is uh, not necessarily the creation of, of a united Kievan church. This has been the dream of many for decades, uh, going back to... Uh, Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky of blessed memory, uh, all the way to the initiators of the Kievan study group, and there's still interest in this discussion today. And I think that that dialogue should happen and that it's healthy and good for all Christians in Ukraine. Uh, but I think that, that they need to focus on the dialogue first, because what's been missing uh, throughout these years of uh, ecclesial positioning in Ukraine it is a meaningful dialogue that has some kind of concrete, tangible results. Now that you have an autocephalous church that's recognized with new leadership that is, uh, has the opportunity to turn the page and to break with the Soviet past, um, that meaningful dialogue could have some teeth in doing some good for education, for being a consultant, a confidant, a prophetic challenger to things that happen in the political arena in Ukraine, uh, and also for, for really demonstrating to the world that these reports of religious violence and persecution are, are more false than they are true. These reports that are, that are circulated among the media and, and reproduced on the internet.